Hey everybody, and welcome to the fifth video in the series where we are building a Minecraft clone from scratch using JavaScript and 3.js. In this video, we're going to be tackling the problem of collision detection. In the last video, we added a player to our game, and we added mouse and keyboard controls so our player could move around the world. However, our player character doesn't currently interact with the terrain, so it's not very fun. <sighs> now what we're trying to solve in this video is determining when our player collides with the terrain and then handling that appropriately so the player doesn't go through the terrain. Now we'll be representing our player as a cylinder, kind of like the soup can that I have here, and our world is really just a bunch of blocks, so kind of like this box that I have here. So the problem essentially boils down to how do we know when a cylinder is colliding with the cube? Now I'll be explaining how we accomplish all of this as we go on. So let's dive into the code and let's start creating a class that will contain all of our collision detection logic. Alrighty, let's get started. So the first thing that we need to do is to create a file that will store our collision detection logic. So I'm gonna create a new file. I'm gonna name that physics.js. Now I went ahead and imported the 3.js dependency and I've also added a physics class here with just an empty constructor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out kind of the structure of this class and how we're going to handle these collisions. And then I'll talk through what each of those methods is doing. So the first method that I've added here is called update. And this is where we're going to be running our collision detection code. So this is going to be moving the physics simulation forward in time by dt, which is the change in time from the last time this function was called. Our Update method is calling detect collisions. So let's go ahead and add this method in. So detect collisions is our main collision detection code. That's where we call all of our helper functions. So we pass in the reference to the player and the world. And then there's three different functions within this that we call. And these are broad phase, narrow phase, and resolve collisions. Our collision detection code is broken into three separate phases or functions the broad phase, the narrow phase, and resolve collisions. In the broad phase, we filter down the list of blocks we're going to check for collisions by finding the set of blocks that are closest to the player. In the narrow phase, we take the candidate blocks from the broad phase and check to see if any collide with our player's bounding cylinder. If they do, we calculate the point of collision, the overlap between the block and the player, and the collision normal. In the final resolution stage, we take all of the collisions that we found in the narrow phase and process them one by one. For each collision, we adjust the position of the player so it is no longer colliding with the block and zero out the player's velocity in the direction of the collision normal. So I'm in the main file right after we create the scene and the world and the player. So I'm gonna create a new constant here called physics. And this will be our new physics class. Now down in our animation loop here. So right after we move our player, let's go ahead and call update on our physics class. And then we'll pass in DT, player, and the world. All right, so we have everything wired up now. Let's go ahead and actually start implementing our collision detection code. So before we can implement this, we need to actually go into our player and add the radius and the height. So at the very top here, we'll define two new properties on our player. So we'll do radius and we'll set that to 0.5 and then height will be 1.75. So each block is a size of one. So the, the radius of our player's bounding cylinder is half the size of a block and the height of our player is just under two blocks high. So let's go ahead and remove this comment here. Now the first thing that we need to do is to compute the extents of our player. So I've created the skeleton of an object here that is gonna store our player extents. So you can see for each coordinate, X, Y, and Z, we're calculating a minimum and maximum extent. So starting with the minimum X here, we can take the position of our player in the X axis and we can subtract the player's radius. That's the farthest distance from the player in the negative x direction. Now we want all of these to be in block coordinates. So they need to be integers. So I'll just round this down to the nearest block. So similarly for the x maximum here, let's take the x position of our player and we'll add the radius to get the maximum extent of the player along the x axis. 
and then we want to round this up to the nearest block. Now the z-axis is very similar to the x um, because we're just taking, instead of the x, it's now the z position and subtracting the radius there, and then flooring it for the minimum and taking the ceiling for the maximum. Now the, the y is slightly different for the minimum, and we'll take the player's y position, and we're going to subtract the player's height here. Now for the maximum, we'll take the ceiling. So we're just taking the very top part of that player and then we're just rounding it up to the nearest block. So now that we have our extents, we really just do a triple for loop. We just iterate over the minimum and maximum along each axis and we just get all of the blocks that are inside that volume. So I went ahead and added that triple for loop so you can see we're looping from the x minimum to the x maximum y min to y max, z min to z max. So within this for loop, we want to get the block at this x, y, and z position from the world. And if the block exists and the block ID is not equal to an empty block ID, then we want to push that block onto our array of candidates. So let's add a little bit of debugging help down here. I'll add a console log. So let's say broad phase candidates. And then in here, we'll just print out the number of candidates in that array. Right, so within our game now, we can see that it's printing out the broad phase candidates to the console. And it's just printing out zero, zero, zero over and over again. Now, if I move my player into this hillside, I should expect that number to go up. So as I get very close here, you can see that we're now showing that the player is potentially colliding with four different blocks. So I think we need to add some visual aids to help us see where the actual bounds of our player are, as well as highlighting those Canada blocks that the player is colliding with. So first I wanna add something that'll help us visualize our player's bounding cylinder. So I'm in the player class right now, and I'm in the constructor for that class. So right after we add our event listeners, let's add some additional code here. Now I've created a new property on our class called bounds helper, and this is storing a new mesh. So this mesh is gonna represent our player's bounding cylinder. So you can see I've passed in a cylinder geometry. I've given it the radius and the height of the player. And this parameter here just sets the, the number of sides of that cylinder. So I've set it that to 16 sides. And we're also rendering it as a wireframe so we can see through it when we're in the player's perspective. Finally, we need to make sure that we add that bounds helper to the scene. So I'm just doing that in this line here. Now we need to make sure that whenever the player moves, that the bounding cylinder moves with the player. So let's add an additional method below apply inputs where we update our player's bounding cylinder. Now I've added a new method here called update bounds helper. So what are we doing in here? We are copying the position of our player into the position of the bounds helper. And then we're shifting the Y position of our bounds helper down by half of the player's height. And we need to make sure that we're calling update bounds helper every frame. So let's go back into our main file here. And right after we apply our inputs to our player, we'll do player update bounds helper. Now in our game, we can see that we now have our bounding cylinder helper being rendered. And we can tell it's at the correct location because the camera helper is right at the top center of the cylinder. Now if I go and just turn our player's speed down just a touch here, it's easier to visualize. So as I enter a block here, you can kind of see the, the lines of that bounding cylinder are now intersecting with that block. Now you can see that when we're colliding with that block, we're actually registering a collision in our broad face. So it's printing to the console, broad face candidates one right now. That's because we're colliding with one block. Now it'd be even more helpful if we could visualize the blocks that we're actually colliding with. So let's say if I'm colliding with this block here, we can highlight that block in red. So let's go and add that in now. Now in order to visualize the block that we're colliding with, I'm gonna do somewhat of a hack here. So rather than changing the color of that particular block, I'm actually just gonna create a new box mesh that's just slightly bigger than the block itself. Now I'm gonna make that larger box 
red and just slightly transparent so that we can actually see the block underneath. And that's gonna make it look like we're highlighting the block when really there's just another block around it that's giving it that color. So I'm gonna start by creating a new variable on our physics class called helpers. And this is just gonna be a group that will contain all of those blocks that we'll be creating. So we need to add this group to our scene. So I'll add a scene parameter to our constructor and then scene add this.helpers. And then in our main file, when we're creating our physics object, we need to make sure to pass in scene here. Now I've added two new constants here right above where we're defining our physics class. And those are collision material and collision geometry. And this will be the material and geometry for those helper blocks. So you can see I've given it a color red I set it transparent and set the opacity to 0.2. So it's mostly transparent, but you can still see some color there. Now let's go ahead and create a new function where we're creating those meshes for our helper blocks. So at the very bottom of our physics file, I've added a new function called add collision helper. So we basically just pass in the X, Y, and Z coordinates of our block. And then we go ahead and create a new mesh at that location. So we're using the geometry and the collision material that we defined at the top of the file. And then we're just copying the position of the block into that helper, and then we're adding it to our helpers group. Now we need to actually call our add collision helper method. So in our broad phase function, every time that we're adding a new candidate to this array here, we need to go ahead and call this add collision helper. Then we'll pass in block. And I actually made a bit of a typo here. We don't actually want to pass in the block because that only has the block ID and the block instance ID. So what I'm going to do is get the block position. And that's just going to be an object containing the X, Y, Z coordinates of the block. And this is really what we want to be keeping track of in the collision detection code. We don't care so much about the ID or the instance ID. We want to know where that block is. So apologies for uh, making that typo there. Now back in our game, I'll expect that when I collide with these blocks that they will highlight. So as I get closer here, I can see that there's a bit of an issue and it looks like everything is offset by half. So I think there's an issue with where we're actually creating our world blocks. I think I'm adding a, a half offset in each direction. So I think we need to remove that and then try this again. So yeah, here's that particular line I was talking about. So I'm in the world class and I'm in the generate meshes function here. If we scroll down to when we're actually setting the position of our instances, I was initially adding this half offset so that the, the bottom left corner of the cube was aligned with the world origin, but that's kind of throwing off the math. So I'm just gonna remove that. And now as I collide with these blocks, you can see that they are now highlighted red. So I can move through these and get a really good idea of which blocks the player is colliding with. So in this particular case, you can see that even though the player isn't colliding with this block, it is still highlighted red. And that's what I was talking about where the broad phase is a very coarse and fast phase of collision detection, where we're not super concerned if we're actually colliding with that block or not. We just want to get a rough idea of the blocks that we could be colliding with. So now we'll be working on the narrow phase of our collision detection where we take all of these candidate blocks, we compare them with the player's bounding cylinder, and we determine which blocks the player's actually colliding with and then getting contact points from those collisions. So in our narrow phase function here, let's start by iterating over all of the candidates that we've passed in. And remember that those candidates are just an array of X, Y, and Z positions of those blocks. So for each of our candidate blocks, we need to do three different things. First, we need to get the point on that block that is closest to our player's bounding cylinder. And then we need to determine if that point is inside the player's bounding cylinder. If it is, that means there's actually a collision taking place there. So if a collision is taking place, then we need to calculate the contact point so where exactly on the player's bounding cylinder is that block intersecting? We need to determine the amount of overlap. We're gonna be using that in the resolve collision step. And that overlap is the amount that will need to move the player away from that block so it's no longer colliding with it. 
And the collision normal basically tells us at what angle is that collision happening. So if you were to take the block and the player's cylinder, what is the arrow that we can draw between those two to determine where that collision is happening? So first, let's start by calculating the point on the block that is closest to the player. So here is the code for calculating the closest point. Now, it's a bit hard to understand this code just by looking at it. So let's draw out what's happening here in terms of the math so we can understand this a bit better. So I've made a little drawing here that will hopefully explain how we're calculating the closest point on the block to our player. So you can see this white block here, this white square is our block. And this blue dot here labeled P, that is our player's position. Now I've copied our logic down on the bottom here where we're calculating the maximum and minimum. So we'll kind of walk through the step by step and see what exactly this is calculating. So these X and Y coordinates right here this is the center of our block. And we're also doing this in the z-axis as well, but obviously that's a bit harder to draw, so we're just going to look at this in 2D for now. The same thing applies to the z-axis as well. So what we're doing is we're taking the, starting with the inner function here, the minimum between p dot x and x plus 1 half. So if we compare p dot x, which is right here, to x plus 1 half, which is right here, we can clearly see that p dot x is the smaller of those, so we're going to go with that value. Now then we take the maximum between x minus 1 half and p dot x, so x minus 1 half is right here, and we can see that that is greater than the x coordinate of p. So we're going to go with this as our closest x coordinate. Now let's do the same thing for the y. Let's compare the minimum of p dot y and y plus one half. So p dot y, that's going to be right here, and y plus one half is going to be up here. Now the minimum of those is p dot y, so we'll pick that one. And now let's take the maximum of y minus one half, which is right here, and p dot y. So in this case, p dot y is greater than y minus 1 half. So we're going to go with this as our closest y coordinate. So we have our closest x and we have our closest y. So let's take these both together and see what that closest point is. So the closest x is x minus 1 half, which is right here. And the closest y is the y coordinate of our player, which is right here. So you can see that the closest point on this block, this square, to our player is right here. And intuitively, that makes sense. So if we draw a line between our player's position here to that point, we can just see that as the closest point on that block. So we just do the same thing for the z-axis as well, and that's always going to give us that closest point between the block and the player. So for the second step here, we're going to calculate the distance between the closest point that we've calculated here and the center of our player's bounding cylinder. So here we've calculated those distances. I've assigned them to constants dx, dy, and dz. I'm taking the x-coordinate of our closest point, and I'm subtracting the x-position of our player, which is the, the center of that bounding cylinder. And the z is basically the same as the x. Now the y is a little bit different here. The y position of our player is the top of the bounding cylinder. So we need to subtract half of the player's height to get to the center of the cylinder. Then we're subtracting that whole thing from the y coordinate of our closest point. And that'll tell us how far our point on our block is from the center of that cylinder. Now in order to keep our code clean, I'm gonna create a helper function that will take in a point and our player object and it'll determine if that point is inside the player's bounding cylinder. So let's scroll to the bottom of our file and let's add that helper function down here. So here's our function point in player bounding cylinder and this returns a true or false value. So it returns true if the point P that we pass in is inside the player's bounding cylinder. I can see this is very redundant with the information that we just calculated. Um, but we're going to be using those for two different things, so it'll all make sense in the end.
Now I thought I would put together a little drawing here to help explain how we're going to check if a point is inside our player's bounding cylinder. So for the sake of simplicity here, this is just the top-down view looking at the XZ plane. So let's quickly walk through what all of these different variables are. So P here, this is the center of our player's bounding cylinder. Q is that closest point that we just calculated, the closest point on the box to the player's bounding cylinder. And R is the radius of the bounding cylinder. So DX and DZ here, that is the difference in the X and Z axes between our center of our player's bounding cylinder and our closest point. So let's quickly calculate those out. So DX is going to be Q dot X minus P dot X. And we can calculate DZ as Q dot Z minus P dot Z. So given DX and DZ, how do we use that information to determine if Q lies within this circle? So if we remember back to geometry, we can actually compute the hypotenuse of this triangle here. Let's call that little r. So we know that if distance between P and Q, or little r, is less than big R, the radius of our player's bounding cylinder, then we know that, at least within the XZ plane, that Q is within our player's bounding cylinder. So how do we compute R? We can use the Pythagorean theorem for that. So R is equal to the square root of dx squared. We gotta make sure we stay color coordinated here. Plus dz squared. We wanna check the relation little r is less than big R. So if this holds true, then we know that Q is within the, the circle here. So we can make one quick optimization since square roots are a bit expensive. We can just square both sides of this equation. So we end up with this final relation dx squared. So I'm just substituting this in for r and taking the square of that plus dz squared. Then we just check to make sure that is less than r squared. So this right here is what we need to calculate in our code. And the last thing that we need to do is just check to see if the dy, the difference between the center of the player's bounding cylinder and the closest point, we just need to make sure that is within the height of the bounding cylinder. And then we know for sure that this is a collision point. So now that we have a visual for what's going on with this code, let's go step by step through each line and see what's going on here. So I've already shown how we're calculating dx, dy, and dz. So I'm using dx and dz here. So I'm squaring each of these and adding them together to get that little r squared. Now to check if the contact point is inside the player's bounding cylinder, first we're checking to see if the y coordinate was within the player's bounding cylinder. So we're just taking dy, and remember this is the difference between the point and the center of the cylinder. So if that distance is less than half the height of the cylinder, then we know it's within that height. And then we're also checking to see that the little r squared is less than big R squared, where big R is the radius of the bounding cylinder. So I know there's a lot of variables going on here, a lot of math, but Collision detection is all about math, and it's kind of fun, I think, when we start putting it all together. All right, so back in our narrow phase function here, right after we calculate dx, dy, and dz, let's utilize our function we just wrote. If the closest point is inside our player's bounding cylinder, Actually. then we need to calculate this information here. We need to calculate the contact point, how much that point is overlapping into the player's bounding cylinder and the collision normal. So we actually already have the contact point. That is the closest point. So we don't need to do anything there. So let's go ahead and calculate that overlap. So we calculate the overlap in the y-axis by taking half of the player's height and then subtracting the absolute value of dy. And then the overlap in the xz direction so that's sort of the, the radial direction of the bounding cylinder. We're taking the radius of that bounding cylinder and we're subtracting the, that little r, the distance between 
the center of the bounding cylinder to the closest point. Now, I'm not going to get into all the math here. I don't want to make this a big talk about math. So if this is a bit confusing to you, I just recommend kind of drawing it out on paper and just trying to figure out what's going on there. So after computing the overlap in the y-axis in the xz plane, the next thing that we need to do is to determine which overlap is smaller. So that's the one that we're most concerned with. We want to be moving the player as little as possible so it's no longer intersecting with the block. That will give us the best visual result. If we have an a really large overlap in one axis, and we have to move the player really far to not collide with that block, then it's going to be quite jarring to the player. So we first check to see which overlap is smaller. So in this case, the Y overlap is smaller so that we know the collision normal is going to be up and down. So it's either going to be pointing out of the player's bounding cylinder, out of the top, or out of the bottom. And that's going to depend on the basically the sign of our y difference here. And then our final overlap is going to be our y-axis overlap. So if our overlap in the xz plane, so in the radial direction, if that's smaller, then we go with this branch here. So the collision normal in this case really just points from the center of the player's bounding cylinder to that contact point. Then we're setting the overlap to the overlap in the XZ plane. So we finally have enough information to fully describe the collision. So we build an object here that contains the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the block that we're colliding with, the contact point, which is the closest point that we calculated up here, the collision normal, and then the overlap between the block and the player's bounding cylinder. Now, I know this is definitely one of the more complicated parts of the code, but it's just kind of unavoidable when you're dealing with collision detection. There's a lot of geometry involved. So I think we're ready to finally test this code. So as a first stage of testing at the very bottom of our function here, let's just print to console the number of narrow phase collisions that we're detecting. I would expect that the number of collisions is going to be either equal to or less than the number of candidates, since we know that not all of those candidates result in collisions. So that's the result that we're expecting to see here. All right, so back in our game now, let's start intersecting with some blocks and seeing if we're getting the results that we expect. So I did a bit of movie magic here, so we're just not just blasting things to the console super fast. So it's only writing the console log statements once every second. That's why things are a bit slower here. So, so as I get close to a block here, we can see that we're registering one broad face candidate, but it's not registering as an actual collision, which makes sense because if we look, our player's bounding cylinder is not actually intersecting that block. Now, if I get a little bit closer here and finally intersect with that block, you can see that we're now registering a collision so if I back out just a little bit, the collisions goes back to zero. So our code does appear to be working here. We're getting very accurate collision detection between our bounding cylinder and that block. Now, if I get a little bit closer here, you can see that we have four candidates. And if I just come right in here, you can see that we are intersecting with four different blocks here. So while these console log statements are nice, it would be nice to actually visualize the collision points. So much like we did for the blocks where we highlight them red if we're colliding with them. Let's add some additional helpers to visualize those contact points for each collision. So similar to what we did for visualizing the broad phase collisions, I've added an additional material and geometry down here that we use to visualize the contact points. Contact material is just a basic wireframe material that I've given a color of bright green. Then the geometry is going to be a very small sphere, 0 0.05 radius. And then this just controls the amount of sides on that sphere. I set it to something um, just really kind of rough so it's not taking a huge performance hit. Now, right below add collision helper, I've added a new method called add contact point helper. So we're just passing in a set of X, Y, and Z coordinates. Then we're creating our contact mesh using the geometry and material that we defined. And then we're copying the 
position of our contact point P into the position of our mesh so that that sphere is centered on the contact point. And then we're adding it to our group of helpers here. So right after we create our collision here and push it onto the array, let's call add contact point helper. And then remember that closest point is our contact point. So we'll just pass closest point in here. So now as our player collides with these blocks, we can see that we're visualizing the contact points. But remember that this is the point on each block that is closest to the player's bounding cylinder. So our narrow phase code is working exactly like we want it to now. So we can finally move on to the third stage of our collision detection, which is resolving the collisions. So just to recap what we've done so far, we first get our list of candidate blocks from our broad phase. We pass those candidate blocks into the narrow phase to get the list of collisions. Then if we have any collisions at all, then we pass them to resolve collisions. So we pass that array of collisions from the narrow phase as well as our player object. Now the first thing that we need to do in our resolve collisions function here is we need to sort our collisions from the smallest overlap to the largest. And the reasons for this is stability. By resolving those smaller collisions first, it gives a much smoother result when we're colliding with the terrain. If we don't do that sorting step, we can get kind of a jerkiness when the player is pushing up against a wall. So I've added that sorting code here. We're just calling sort on our collisions array. And we're just passing in this function here that takes a two collisions and sorts them from smallest overlap to largest overlap. Now, once we've sorted those, we can go on to resolving the collisions. So there's two things we need to do. We need to adjust the player's position and also adjust the player's velocity. So let's start with adjusting the player's position. So in adjusting the player's position, what we're trying to do is determine how much the player is overlapping with the block and move the player just enough so it's no longer colliding with the block. So the amount that we're moving the player by, we're calling delta position. So this is a vector three. So we're starting by taking the collision normal. So this is the, the vector that's pointing from our player to the contact point. And we're just cloning that to get a new copy of it. And then we're taking that normal and we're multiplying it by our overlap. So we're scaling that vector to be the size of that amount of overlap. So by adding that delta position to the player, we're pushing that player away from the block in the direction of that collision just enough so it's no longer overlapping. Now in our game now, we should expect that if we move a player into a block that it is going to no longer pass through that block. It's going to be pushed back. So as I come up against this wall here, you know, there's a bit of jerkiness going on here, which we're going to fix, but we can see that the player is no longer going through that wall. Now, the reason for this jerkiness is what I explained earlier in the video. We need to use a fixed time step when we're running our physics. If we use a varying time step, but from frame to frame, we're going to get this kind of jerky motion. So that's going to be the very last thing that we're going to fix. Um, but I promise at the very end of this, we're going to have silky smooth collision detection. So before we move on to the second part of resolving the collision, which is negating the player's velocity along the collision normal, I think it'd be a good time to add gravity and that'll give us a good test case. So when the player's falling down, we'll make sure that the player doesn't fall through the blocks. So at the top of our physics class here, let's add a new variable called gravity. And I'll give this a value of 32. So the acceleration due to gravity is about 32 feet per second squared. So that's where I'm picking this value from here. So now we need to apply this gravity to our player. So each frame, we're gonna multiply gravity by the change in time to get the change in velocity. So we need to calculate that change in velocity before we apply the inputs here, because this is where we're updating the position. So I'm actually gonna take these two lines and I'm just going to remove them. And then in our physics code, we're going to do the player updates here. So right before we run detect collisions. So right before this line, let's just apply gravity to our player. Do player velocity y. And then we'll subtract gravity times dt. 
So if we multiply an acceleration by a change in time, that gives us a velocity. So we're taking that change in velocity and then just applying that to the y velocity of our player. So that'll just keep making our player fall faster and faster and faster until they collide with something. Now in our player class, we need to make sure that we're updating the y position of our player now that we have a y component in the velocity. So right below these two lines where we're updating the player's x and z position, let's do this position.y plus equals this.velocity.y times dt. Now in the game now, you can see that our player is falling, but they eventually just fall through the terrain. Now we can see that it catches just for a second on the terrain, and this is because of that position adjustment that we did. But we're falling through because we're not negating the velocity of the player. And that's why that's so important. So in order to keep our player from falling through the world, we need to implement the final part of resolving collisions, and that is negating or canceling out the player's velocity along the collision normal. So in our player class here, I'm going to add a new variable, actually a private variable called world velocity. And just because of how 3JS handles vectors, I just want to declare this vector one time, and I'll just keep updating this vector with the latest world velocity. So, so I'm setting it as a private variable using this pound sign here. And then right below our constructor, I'm going to add a accessor. So I'll use get world velocity. And in here, we'll compute the world velocity from the player's local velocity. So let's walk through these few lines here. First, we're getting the local velocity of the player and we're copying that into our world velocity variable. And then we're rotating our world velocity by the Y rotation of our camera. So basically, wherever the character is looking, we're gonna rotate by that amount to get the velocity in world coordinates. And then we're returning that value back. So now in our resolve collisions function, we need to calculate the velocity adjustment to the player once it collides with the block. So we can compute that adjustment using just two lines here. So first we need to determine the magnitude of that adjustment. So how much of that velocity is going to get canceled out. So we do that by taking the dot product of the world velocity with the collision normal. And then we take that magnitude and then we multiply that with the collision normal. So remember that the collision normal is the vector from the center of the player to the point we're colliding with. So you can imagine any velocity that's coming through that point, we're canceling that out. Now this velocity adjustment is in world coordinates, so we need to convert this back to local coordinates so we can adjust the player's local velocity. So I've added this little helper function in our player to assist with rotating from the world frame back into the local frame. So it's kind of the opposite of what we're doing here. Here we're taking the, the world velocity and rotating it by the camera Y rotation. So we just need to do the opposite of that to our, our delta velocity here. So we're rotating by the negative Y rotation of the camera to convert dB from world coordinates to the local coordinates. And that's what velocity is in here. So finally, we apply that velocity to the player. So we call our apply world delta velocity function and we pass in our velocity adjustment. So I'm negating that, so that canceling out that velocity rather than adding it on. So now in our game, I'll expect that when I go into first person view and the physics kicks in that our player doesn't fall through the world anymore, it's gonna collide with the ground and then we'll be able to walk around. So let me just press W and it'll reset the camera. And you can see it's a still a little bit jerky. We're going to fix that issue. Um, but now I can walk around the terrain. I'm not falling through it. I can walk up against these walls and not go through them. So it looks like our position and velocity adjustments that we're applying in resolve collisions are working correctly. So that is awesome. Now it's just a matter of fine tuning things a bit. So we need to implement that fixed time steps so we're not getting this jerkiness of the player movement. Before we go and implement that though, I think it'd be fun to add jumping in the game. That way we can kind of jump up and down these blocks. I mean, it's kind of a core component of Minecraft being able to explore. So before we do the fixed time step, let's go and work on that code. So back in our player here, I'm gonna add a new property under height called jump speed. 
So let's give this a value of 10. And then I want another property called on ground. This basically just tells us when the player is actually on the ground or not. So when the player is not on the ground, we don't want them to be able to jump again. Otherwise they can just keep hitting jump and just fly away. So in our on key down event handler under our player here, let's scroll down to the very bottom and let's add a new case. So when the space bar is pressed, if the player is on the ground, then we'll update the Y velocity of our player by adding the jump speed. Now we need to make sure that we're setting on ground appropriately. So when the player is on the ground versus not on the ground. So in our physics code, let's go and locate the code in narrow phase. So this is a, a little bit hacky here, but we know that when we're colliding in the along the Y axis that the player is colliding with a the block. They're kind of falling into the block from top down vertically. So here we can set player on ground equal to true. And we need to make sure that we're resetting this every single time we're updating our physics. You know, if we're not getting a collision, then we make sure we set this to false. So scrolling back up to detect collisions. So right before we kick off everything, let's do player on ground equals false. So now our player can jump around the world and we can get up to these taller blocks here. It's still a bit um, shaky because we're having some issues with the uh, the simulation not being smooth. It's not registering a jump every time, but that should be fixed when we implement the fixed time step. So I quickly wanted to show you what's going on with the time step here, just so you have some idea of why we're having issues with the player being kind of jerky. So I'm printing the DT, so the, the time of each frame to the console right now. So you can see it's varying quite a bit. It's going as low as seven milliseconds all the way up to 11 milliseconds. So this means that our player is kind of able to move a different amount in each frame and the physics is having a hard time handling that. So I thought I'd drop a quick diagram here to help explain what I'm talking about when I'm saying variable time step versus fixed time step. So if we're looking at the, the horizontal axis here as time, each one of these ticks is when a new frame is happening or a new update. So for our rendering, we can see this is happening at a variable rate. So if I was to just number these updates as one, two, three. So you can see that the update between frames one and two is much shorter than the update between frames two and three. Now, physics is not like that. It's just, as we can see, it's not gonna run really well when we're using that variable time step. So we force it to use a fixed time step. So the time between frames one and two is going to be the same time between frames two and three. So what this means is that sometimes we might be running the physics more often or twice every time we're updating the rendering. So here we can see frames one and one line up, frames two and two line up, but there's a big delay between when the third frame is rendered. So in that time, we're actually doing another physics update and we're not even rendering anything on the screen. And we're doing then another update once that third frame is rendered. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be accumulating our delta time between each frame. So once that accumulated delta time is greater than our physics time step, big T, then we're gonna kick off our physics and we're gonna run an update. So each time we kick off our physics, we're gonna subtract our time step from our accumulated delta time, and we'll just keep running the physics until delta t is less than big T. So to implement this fixed time step, we're gonna add three new variables to our physics class. So that will be simulation rate. So I'll just set that to, I'll let's say 200 for now. So we'll run 200 times per second. And our time step is going to be equal to one divided by our simulation rate. So if we take frequency and divide it into one, then we get the, the time step. And we also need a variable to store the accumulated delta time. So we'll just call that accumulator and then we'll initialize that to zero. So in order to implement the fixed time step, the first thing that we need to do is add dt to our accumulator value. Then we're gonna do a while loop here. So while our accumulated value is greater than or equal to this dot time step, then we want to run our physics code. 
So each time we do a physics update, we're going to be subtracting that time step. So this will cause our accumulated value to decrease over time so our while loop doesn't run indefinitely. And then the final tweak we need to make, since we're running this at a rate of time step, we're not going to use DT here. This is the DT for our rendering loop. So we want to use our fixed time step instead. So change these two references to DT to this dot time step. So now that when we move around the world, we can see that things are much more stable. You can still see just a little bit of shaking if we're looking at the wireframe and the bounding cylinder. But now when we go into walls, we're not getting that just shaking back and forth. So that is looking much better. There's one final tweak that we need to do to make all of the jerkiness go away. So let's go and apply that fix right now. Now there's one more check that we need to add and resolve collisions. So right now when we are resolving collisions, we're doing it one at a time. So we're calculating the amount that we need to move the player so it's no longer colliding with that block. Now, it just so happens that we might be moving the player so that all of the subsequent collisions that we're gonna check, we're no longer colliding with those blocks anymore. So you can imagine if the player is sitting on the ground, maybe colliding with two or three blocks. If we move it out of the first block, it's no longer colliding with the second or the third blocks either. So, so there's just one additional line that we need to add here. So before we go and resolve each collision, we're gonna do a recheck to make sure that the collision point is still inside the player's bounding cylinder. And if it no longer is, then we're just gonna continue on to the next collision point. So now we can see that our collision detection is super smooth. There's no shaking of the player anymore. I can go up against the wall here and slide around and everything is just really smooth and there's no jerkiness at all. And the responsiveness of the jumping is also a lot better. I can just kind of jump up to this top of this mountain here and yeah, it's all looking good. So that's a wrap for this video. Thanks for sticking through it. I know this was a tough one, but now we have fast and stable collision detection in our Minecraft game. So in the next video, the sixth video, we're gonna be learning how to create an infinite world or a procedurally generated infinite world. So we no longer will just have one little square that our player can move around they can keep exploring in any direction and they'll just keep generating terrain. So thank you so much for watching. If you're enjoying this series, be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. And until next time, see you later, folks.